In this short video, we're going to talk about critical numbers and the extreme value theorem. Let's look at the statement. If f is continuous on the closed interval a comma b, then f attains an absolute maximum f of c and an absolute minimum f of d at some numbers c and d in a comma b. So in our previous videos, we saw a function where it had no uh, absolute minimum value, even though it was a bounded function. And the only reason that could happen is because it, it had a jump discontinuity. So if we don't have any discontinuities, then we are always going to have an absolute maximum value and an absolute minimum value on a closed interval. So here's an example where we have a jump discontinuity. There is an absolute min at the end point, but there is no absolute max. Now, this extreme value theorem, the EVT, and remember, any theorem that has a name and an abbreviation is a very important theorem. So our, the EVT is what we call an existence theorem. It tells us that these numbers C and D exist, but offers no way of actually finding C and D. So that's what we're going to be looking at really in the next couple of videos, the rest of this video and the next video. How can we find those numbers C and D where the absolute minimum value occurs and the absolute maximum value occurs. Well, we're going to look at Fermat's theorem. No, not that theorem. It's not his last theorem. It's just another theorem by Fermat. If F has a local max or min at X equals C, and if F prime of C exists, then f prime of c equals zero. So we have to be careful with this statement. We have to be given that f has a local max or min, local min at c. That's what's given. The conclusion is that f prime of c would equal to zero. And that conclusion can only be true if f prime of c exists. And let's just think about this for a minute. We don't have to go through a step-by-step -step formal proof, but sometimes it's worth trying to understand why these things are true. If H is positive, and I should correct that and say, if H is positive, or I could say when H is positive, then the difference quotient F of C plus H minus F of C uh, all over H is gonna be greater than or equal to zero. So think about that for a minute. We're saying that um, F of C is going to be a local max. Did I have this uh, reversed? So let me change this to a local min. Because I want that to be I want this to be greater than or equal to zero because then C was always going to be smaller than F of C plus H. H is a positive number. So I have a positive number over a positive number. That'll be greater than or equal to zero. Well, what does that tell us then? That says that
the limit as h approaches zero from the right of that difference quotient will always be greater than or equal to zero. And then that will say that if that means that uh, f prime of c has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's when h is positive. So the next thing to think about would be, okay, well, if uh, h is negative, then our inequality is reversed. And so, the limit as h approaches zero from the left of that difference quotient is also going to be less than or equal to zero, which will tell me that f prime of c is going to have to be less than or equal to zero. And since we found that f prime of c is both greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to zero, then the only way that that could be true is if f prime of c actually equals zero. So for Moss theorem, we can actually make some sense of that. Now, I have to be really careful here because from Moss theorem, does not say that whenever f prime of c equals zero, then we must have a local max or a local min. That's the converse, which is not true. What we need to be looking at is that, oh, what's given is we must start with a local max or a min. And then if f prime of c exists, then it must equal zero. And we can just think of an x cubed function like f of x equals two fifths x cubed. Here we have our graph, take the derivative and we can see that the derivative is zero. So f prime of zero equals zero, but zero is neither a local max nor a local min. As you go to the left, the numbers get smaller, the y coordinates get smaller, but when you go to the right, the y coordinates get larger. And then remember, Fermat's theorem says that, oh, f prime of c has to exist. Well, think about the absolute value function. Yeah, with the absolute value function, f prime of zero does not exist, uh, but uh, zero is an local min and also an absolute min. So to th think about these two cases where the derivative is zero or where the derivative is not, does not exist, we can put those together and call those x values where the derivative is zero or the derivative is not defined. We're gonna call them critical numbers. Now there's an important phrase here in this definition a critical number of a function is a number x equals c in the domain of f. So there's a lot of times we can look at the formula for the derivative and find numbers where the derivative is not defined, but those numbers are not in the domain of f. And since they're not in the domain of f, they are not critical numbers. So let's finish with an example. Find all critical numbers of f of x equals x squared over 2 plus 8 over x. So I find the derivative using the power rule. I'll get x minus 8 over x squared. I'll set that equal to 0 to find all numbers where the derivative equals 0. Do some algebra here. I'll multiply both sides by x squared. I get the equation x cubed minus 8 equals 0. That has the solution x equals 2. 
Now, when I look at the formula for f prime of x, I can see that this formula is not defined when x equals zero. However, if I look at the original formula for x, I can see that x equals zero is not in the domain of f. So x equals zero is not a critical number. So my only critical number is x equals two. So I'll post another video where we do more examples where we have to find all the critical numbers of a function.